And I'm going to extend this now to, to the biology. And I want to uh, uh, show you the uh, website for free articles and references uh, about what I'm talking about. So you can go there. And I have uh, two announcements before I talk. Okay. Number one, the science I'm going to present can change your life very profoundly. When I first started lecturing, I told people, this science, with this science, you can create the most wonderful life on this planet. And then the people in the audience would look at me and go, your life does not look that good. And I said something like, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> but the secret I found out is two. First part is to know, to have the, the knowledge. But the second part is the most important, and that part is you must actually use the science in your life or it doesn't work. And the truth as I see it from my own life is that if there is a heaven, I think it's here right now. And that's from using my own knowledge in my life, and that's the big point. Okay, and number two is the medical profession does miracles. However, there are great problems in the medical profession. Medicine uh, does miracles with trauma, like if you break something or you have to cut something out or put something back in, they do miracles. However, if there are illnesses like cancer, Alzheimer's, uh, diabetes, things, these kinds of illnesses, medicine does not do a very good job. And the reason it is not, it is not the practitioner, it is the education that we provide to the medical doctor. I was a professor in medicine, I taught medicine for 20 years, and we do not provide a proper and complete education. And the main reason the pharmaceutical industry does not want us to teach how you can heal yourself. So if I say something bad about medicine, it's not the medical doctor. Okay, I am a uh, cellular biologist and uh, I want to tell you about a misperception you may have. When you look in a mirror and see yourself and you see like one person looking back, it's, that is not true. You are made out of 50 trillion cells and the cells are the living entities. So you are a community, not a single person. But your mind is the government for the 50 trillion cells. And if you have a good government, you have health. If you have like a United States government, then you are sick. <laughs> so it, the part that is the powerful part is in the mind. The cells, I will, t I will talk about cells for this reason. Because every function that you see in the human body is already present in every cell. Every cell has a respiratory, a digestive, an excretory system, Steam. a nervous system, and even an immune system in every single cell. So it's easier to understand how one cell works than to try to understand how 50 trillion cells work. There are two, in, in philosophy, there are two beliefs about how life works and they're very different opposing beliefs. These beliefs come from the time of the ancient Greeks before Christ. And the first belief is from a man called Democritus. He is the man that gave us the word Adam. And this is what he said about how life works. That what you see physically is all there is. There's nothing in the empty space. If you want to understand life, then you have to understand atoms. And that means uncuttable. The smallest thing is an atom. And there's atoms, and then there's empty space. So atoms are in space. And then motion is when atoms hit each other and bounce like a billiard ball. 
So life is atoms colliding with each other. A completely different point of view is provided by Socrates. He has a dualistic vision. Uh, I, one is there's an invisible energy which he calls a form or a soul that gives shape to matter. That this energy was here before life and will be here forever. The energy is separate from matter. That the energy is perfect and ideal, and it is unchanging. Then he talks about the material world, the physical world, and he says that the physical world is imperfect or a corrupt shadow of the ideal. So, for example, you can imagine the p concept of a perfect circle, but you can't, with a pencil, you can't make a perfect circle. So that the invisible world is perfect and the physical world is not. And this is the, fo this is the foundation of like the church that says that this world is not where we want to be, we want to be in the perfect world. So there are two beliefs of how cells are controlled. One is the control comes from the outside in, and the other is that the control is from the inside and goes out. The belief of the outside control is from Socrates that a form or a soul comes in and gives life. And the followers of, of uh, Socrates are spiritualists. In contrast, the followers of Democritus talk about atoms and mechanism. And in the, today's world, religion is the follower of Socrates, and science follows Democritus. Okay. The belief in Democritus is based on the work of Isaac Newton. Uh, Newton was studying what they believed the space and the stars were like a giant machine, a celestial mechanism. Then he created a mathematics called calculus and put in the data, uh, for example, of the moon going around the earth and included mass, gravity, and acceleration. And with his equations, he could predict the accurate movement of the solar system. But he did not put God in the equation. He did not put spirit into the equation or a soul, no energy. So he predicted the universe based only on studying matter. And in conclusion, he said the universe is a machine. And if it is a machine, then the concept of Democritus uh, was right, and that Democritus was based on materialism. So science, including medicine, does not include invisible forces, energy, spirit in their understanding. And the concept of Rene Descartes, he talks about a body, and then he zocked, or said, um, cogito ergo sum, and he came up with the mind. But after Newton, then we separate the mind from the body, and this is a vital force. And in Newtonian physics, which is based on matter only, you eliminate the vital force in the mind. And then medicine only has the body left to study, the physical body. So uh, in the universe, if, if the universe is a machine, then you can take it apart and study it, and then you will know how the universe works by looking at the pieces. So they look at the human body, and the human body is a machine. So in medicine, they take apart the body, look at the molecules, and then try to determine your health by just looking at the physical molecule. So the mission of modern science is to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature, which is a machine. So the, uh, the important understanding is where is the control in, a, in the human machine? And from uh, Charles Darwin, he said that the control is passed from parent to child because the traits of the parents are expressed in the child. And since they were only looking for physical things, chemicals, they took apart the sperm and the eggs
to find which chemicals control life. And 100 years after Charles Darwin, James Watson and Francis Crick tell us the story of DNA. The DNA is a double helix, and the, uh, the pattern for the human body's materials are in just one single helix. So each strand Jeder has strand. a pattern. The pattern is in what they call bases. And the, the bases, are, the letters of the bases are A, T, C, and G, the genetic Und code. And the sequence of the bases uh, determine the structure of protein. And the, there are over 150,000 different proteins to make a human body. The proteins provide for the physical structure, and the proteins also provide for your functions. Based on his belief, Francis Crick created what is called the central dogma. It is like the Ten Commandments of biology. It says that you are protein, you're the protein, but where do you come from? And the information flows in one direction, from DNA to RNA to protein, which is you. So your fate and your structure is programmed in the DNA. The, um, the concept of the central dogma is what I taught in the medical school. And I did not know the meaning of the word dogma until I left the university. And de the definition of dogma is a belief based on religious persuasion and not scientific fact. So uh, for 20 years, I was teaching religion in medical school. The other name for central dogma is the primacy of DNA. And primacy means first cause. So anything about your life, the first cause is DNA. DNA controls life. The genes are DNA. So in this uh, image, uh, were you born that way? Uh, it reveals our belief that all of your traits, physical, behavioral, emotional, are all programmed in the DNA. When we were teaching this in the school, we call it genetic determinism. Genes control and determine the character of your life. But you didn't pick the genes you came with. You can't change the genes you came with. So you become a victim so of your heredity. If cancer is running in your family or heart disease is running in your family, you believe that you will be a victim of the same disease. So science teaches you that uh, the genes are the controlling device, and that makes you powerless. And when people believe they're powerless, they become irresponsible. But the question is, what kind of belief do we teach in the end? So what we were teaching in medical school is conventional belief that the medical model is that you are a biochemical machine controlled by genes. And the significance of that is this is a, a, a based on logic. If a healing profession works in agreement with nature and science, then that healing profession should be a benefit to the patients. But, but if a healing profession does not understand science and nature, then it may be a detriment to the patient. The leading causes of death in the United States are as follows. Number three, cancer, with 553,000 people die every year. Number two is cardiovascular disease, with 700,000 people die every year. And the leading cause of death, it's called iatrogenic illness. And what that means is illness due to medical treatment. 784,000 people die every year from medical treatment, not from the disease, but from the treatment of the disease. Over 300,000 people die from prescription drugs. So the belief in the medical model is false. There are four assumptions that Greg talked about, but I will talk about three of these assumptions and how they relate to the cells and the biology. Assumption number one is that the body is a physical machine made out of parts, chemicals, and molecules and atoms, 
And that's all you need to know. And this is the foundation of Newtonian physics, only studying the material. Assumption number two, genes control biological expression. And assumption number three is that Darwinian evolution provides for the biological world that we have. I will now talk about each one of these in a row and how they relate to biology. The first assumption by, about Newtonian physics. Okay, Science is like a building with many floors, and the lower floors are the foundation for the floors above. The first floor in science is mathematics. Bef before Newton could understand the planets and how they move, he had to create differential calculus. From mathematics, then we go to physics. So Newton took us from math to physics. The study of matter leads to the study of chemistry. There are different kinds of chemistry till you get to biological chemistry, biochemistry, which then leads to biology. And then from biology, we go to psychology. There's a law involved here. If a science on a lower floor changes its belief, all the other sciences above must accommodate that. So in f uh, physics, the one that we are using in medicine is Newtonian physics. And so we want to understand how the cells work. We must understand mechanisms. And mechanics equals physics. So you can say Newtonian physics, Newtonian mechanics, order quantum physics, and quantum mechanics, same thing. So before you can understand how biology works, you must understand mechanisms. That the physics that we talked about, Newtonian physics, said that the universe is a machine made out of matter. But in 1925, quantum physics said, no, the universe is made out of energy. So when we talk about energy, energy are like, oops, energy, uh, is like waves in the water that is in fact actually energy moving through water. So you, this is the actual shape of energy waves going through space. The question is when two waves are coming toward each other, what happens when they meet? And the answer is they become entangled with each other. So in this room right now, there are radio, television waves, cell phone waves, all kinds of energy in the room entangled. But matter, I can separate and study each piece, but energy waves, I cannot separate. So conventional science is reductionistic. It takes things apart and studies pieces. But the new physics, says, no, you have to study wholeness because you cannot separate the energy. So when a doctor looks at a sick patient in his office, he looks at his physical body and tries to understand what's going on. But what we all know about wholeness is that what affects the patients is his job, the family, the environment, the community, so that to study illness, you can't see it just in the physical body. So this is how energy waves interact. I drop two rocks at from the, the same size rocks from the same height at the same time and they hit the water. And the waves, are, the ripples are in phase and they come toward each other. The question is what happens when the waves meet? So I, this is, I will pretend by putting one wave over the top of the other way. This wave goes this way, this wave goes this way, this is overlap. And to find out what you do, you add up the waves, one plus one, equals two. So the two waves interfere with each other. And the result, when they're in phase, is the wave is more powerful. Okay, It is called constructive interference. Okay, There is an opposite effect. This time, I drop the two rocks from the same height, but I drop one before the other. And the ripples come toward each other, but they're out of phase. One wave is going up, one wave is going down. Then, so watch what happens when they meet. Add them up, minus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. So two waves can interfere and cancel each other out. This is called destructive interference. You have all experienced this in your life. Constructive interference is called good vibes. 
and destructive interference, bad vibes. So uh, let's say it's a uh, uh, Saturday night and you have to go to a party and you're tired, tired, and you go to the party and you meet some people who are in wave harmony, and the waves are in harmony with you. And your energy and their energy in phase gives you more power. And then you are walking around with, on your feet, on your toes, very high, constructive interference. Bad vibes. You are in a scary place, and you feel the energy go. <sighs> what is going on is there is energy in the field that conflicts with you, and it cancels your energy. Bad vibes. All animals and all plants communicate with vibration. The gazelle doesn't have to go up to the lion and say, are you my friend? Because at the distance, the energy could be felt and the gazelle will not go there because of bad vibes. If we were, when we were young, were taught to be sensitive to the vibrations, we would not find ourselves in bad relationships and bad places. But we are usually told not to go by our feelings, but to listen to what people have to say. Uh, one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was watching an old movie on TV. It's a British movie, so it was very dry. And I was going to go shut it off, and, uh, and the one line came out that was worth staying up all night for. Language was designed to hide feelings. So the point is, all organisms communicate by, vib by vibrations and know if they're in a good place or a bad place by reading the vibrations, but we humans uh, have that ability but are not trained to use that ability. But I will show you in a little while how vibrations change the proteins of the body. And the proteins give us our structure and our function, so the vibrations can alter our health and our biology. This is a picture of a gold atom. And while you can see it in the electron microscope, if I give you a camera to fly through the atom and take pictures from one side to the other side, when you come back and develop the pictures, there will be nothing on the pictures. And the reason is, is this is the atom that uh, Greg said, this is the, you know, the atom we studied in school. I studied and taught this atom in school. And this is the picture of the quantum atom. So the relevance is why, if an atom is invisible, I cannot put my hand through the table. Well, this is a picture of a tornado. And I, I say, drive your car 150 kilometers per hour straight here. Will the car go through the tornado, yes or no? It would be like hitting a stone wall. The car will be smashed by hitting, hitting the tornado. And yet you can see the tornado, so you say it's physical. But if you take the dirt and the dust out and you then drive across the field at 150 kilometers per hour right here, it would be like a clear day and then you would hit like a stone wall. And the reason is that there's a force field, a force, and you can't go through that force. And atoms are miniature tornadoes. So when we talk about the atom in a textbook, we have the nucleus and the electrons in shells. The protons are positive and the electrons are negative. And every atom has an equal number of protons and electrons. So every atom is neutral. However, the Other electrons things? are not equally distributed. So that on this side of the atom, it's more negative and this side more positive. So if I break a voltmeter and read here is negative, if I take the voltmeter and read here is positive. But the, instead of moving the voltmeter from negative and then move it here as positive, all atoms are spinning all the time. So as this atom is spinning, then I put a voltmeter and one side red is uh, you know, positive and negative, red and blue. So you are watching the, the waves of positive and negative, and I record them. And then when you look at the character of the atom, you see the character is a wave. So atoms are in physics, in today's physics, 
They study the electrical activity of atoms. When you and I went to school, we studied the physical character of the atom, the mass and the weight. And today, physics studies the vibration, not the, not the physical. So that uh, all atoms create waves. So that the picture of the atom is like the waves with the atom in the center. So when we want to study atoms, when you use Newtonian physics, you study two particles hitting each other like billiard balls. But in quantum physics, we don't study the particles because in quantum physics, we study the waves. And we study how the waves interact interference. So there's constructive and destructive interference between atoms. All of the waves together is called the field. So you are made out of atoms, but you also are the field. So you are connected to everything because you can't separate waves. This is a new technology showing you pictures of atoms and electrons. And a scientist can manipulate and make a corral out of the atoms. And trapped in this corral are two electrons. And you can see the waves in the electron microscope picture from the atoms. These are the waves. And then you can see where the waves of one atom and the waves of the other atom interact in interference. So the new physics says, don't look at for particles, talk about the field and the waves. This is from Scientific American, but it's not the title I'm interested in. It's a subtitle. And the relevance is this. Are you made out of atoms and molecules, yes or no? Because if you are, then you are giving off light and energy, and you are absorbing light and energy. So while you see yourself as a physical entity, in the new physics, you are energy waves interacting with each other in the room right now. In the old days, uh, this was the only color picture in my chemistry textbook. And it's the spectrum of emission for each element in the periodic table. There are different frequencies for each atom. What's interesting is in medicine, we don't study energy. Uh, the reason is the drug companies sell chemicals, they don't sell energy. So interesting is that Every element has its own vibrational frequency. And the newest technology in medicine was designed by physicists. CAT scan, MRI, sonogram. And what's interesting is the physicists designed the machine, and what you're reading are the vibrations of the cells and the tissues, and the specific vibrations can tell you if the cells are in health or disease. But medical doctors don't understand the nature of energy. So they will use this as a map to find where a cancer is. And then use a scalpel and, and cut out the cancer. But remember, all atoms give off energy and all atoms absorb energy. And when two energies interfere, you can change the power from zero, from destructive, to increase the power constructive interference. So instead of using a scalpel to cut out a cancer, you should be able to put energy into this cancer and cause the cancer to go away. And this is the physical foundation for hands-on healing for thousands of years. This is a, a simple experiment I did at my home for cheap. <laughs> I took a piece of iron and a file and filed it and made iron dust. And I put the iron filings in a salt shaker and sprinkled them on the paper. Every time I sprinkle it, I get a random pile. So if I throw this away and do it again, I get a random pile. But the next experiment, more expensive, I buy a magnet. Now I sprinkle the filings, and what do I get? I get the magnetic field shaped by the filings. 
And the significance is very important. The filings without the magnetic field are random, but when I put the field in, the field shapes matter. And the significance is, is by Albert Einstein. I'll, I'll make a, a quote from Albert Einstein. The field is the sole governing agency of the particle. And so that the, sh the energy invisible fields shape matter. Can you explain the pattern of the iron filings if you do not understand the field? Yes or no? No. Can you understand the pattern of my cells in health and disease if you don't understand the field? So this is why medicine has failed, because it wants to understand the structure of health and disease but does not include the field in its understanding. And so the field is the sole governing agency of matter. Particles are matter. So your life, your physical life, is controlled by the field, and that's from Albert Einstein. So that our understanding uh, of physics says that uh, medicine does not understand disease because it only focuses on the particles and on matter. So Newtonian physics said study only the body. And quantum physics says no, quantum physics says matter and energy are connected. The new physics, we bring the mind, which is energy, back to the body. And the relevance is just from what Albert Einstein said. So the mind is the field and it gives shape to the body. So what you are believing and what you are thinking so changes your that. body. So in, when we see people, like if I look at the audience or you see us, we see people as physical particles and machines. But that's an illusion because what we are are interacting waves. That's why one person can affect another person just by being in the field. So we go back to science and we say, this is not correct. There's a new mathematics that's important called fractal mathematics, which explains our physical universe. A new physics, quantum physics, which explains the world in terms of energy. A new chemistry called electrochemistry, which deals with vibrations of atoms. And biology and psychology did not bring the new science in yet. By definition, biology and medicine are not scientific. In, when cells were first named, in 1600, Lewin Hook was looking at dead plant tissue. And he saw the cell walls around the, plant, the cells, the, the cellulose walls, but the cells were dead, so they were empty, empty spaces. So he called these spaces cells, like prison cell or but it's the wrong, that's the wrong name. But today, the word cell means something different and it's more appropriate. Because the word cell is used for the word battery, like flashlight cell or dry cell or wet cell. Every cell in your body has a minus voltage on the inside and positive voltage on the outside. Every cell, every live cell is a battery. Every cell has about 1.4 volts, not too much. Aber, but 50 trillion cells in the body times 1.4 volts is 700 trillion volts of electricity in your body right now. And with training and meditation, you can focus this energy called chi, and you can use that energy for healing. With, with that much voltage, people can self-combust. Assumption number one, false. All right. Assumption number two, genes control biology. In the textbooks, they talk about the nucleus controlling the cell. And that's in today's textbooks in grammar school through medical school. And the nucleus has the DNA, and the DNA is believed to be the control. 
as I said before, every function in your body is already present in every cell. So where you have an organ in your body, the cell has an organelle, which means miniature organ. So the textbooks talk about the nucleus is equal to the brain. Uh, watch. If you remove the brain from an organism, the organism dies. But if you remove a nucleus from the cell, the cell lives and the behavior is unaffected. Some cells can live two or more months with no genes, and they carry out all of their normal functions. So enucleation is not removing the brain. So the nucleus is not the brain. But the nucleus does something. When you take out a nucleus, the cell cannot reproduce its parts or itself. So the nucleus is not the brain. The nucleus is the gonad. Since science is a male pro uh, business, and since men think with this organ, they <laughs> made it the brain of the cell. The nucleus does not control the cell. The nucleus is reproduction of the parts. But we went and looked for, um, to find all of the genes that make up a human. And the Human Genome Project was going to be the last biology project. Because once we knew all of the genes, then we would be able to control anything in a human being. It takes one gene to make a protein. There are 150,000 different proteins. How many genes do you need? 150,000. How many genes did we find in the Human Genome Project? 23,000. There's a problem. There are not enough genes to make a human being. So what is wrong is our belief. We are completely wrong about our belief that genes control life. So genes do not control life. The fact. So assumption number two, false. Wrong. Wrong. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> um, in my research, 40 years ago, I started working with stem cells. People think that stem cells are something new. But I learned very many things from the stem cells. The secret of life I learned from stem cells. Right now, in every one of you, you have stem cells throughout your entire body. And these stem cells can replace any tissue or organ in your body. And you should be able to stay young for hundreds of years, as Greg will talk about. So you might ask, then why do we age? And the answer is because the mind controls the cells and the genes. And we collectively believe in aging. So that my research, early, early research, I have a tissue culture with multi-potential stem cells. These are clones, meaning they're all genetically identical. In my experiment, I take a group of cells, so I take this group of cells and put it into another Petri dish with a different environment, environment A. And environment A, the conditions of the medium, the stem cells form muscle. But I could go back and take the very same genetically identical cells and put them into culture dish with environment B and the cells form bone. Or I could go and take the very same cells and put them in culture dish C with a different environment and the cells form fat. What controls the fate of the cell? The environment. They were genetically identical, only the environment was different. So I published this work in 1977. And it's uh, a fine structural analysis of normal and modulated cells in myogenic culture. It sounds like Latin, but in, it sounds like Latin. And so science is like the church. So you can't understand what I'm talking about. But what is the meaning? Is that this is the first scientific report that I made, how the environment 
controls the fate of your cells. And I use the word modulated, meaning altered, because there was no other word. My colleagues were not interested in this work because they were interested in the human genome. So I left the uni I left, I had tenure, and I walked out of the university as a professor, I left the university. Because they were not being scientific, because they didn't want to understand this. So I end up at a better university, the Stanford University Medical School. Uh, there I repeat the experiments, but more sophisticated. And I uh, get the cover of the journal, uh, Differentiation, but I really wanted the cover of Rolling Stone, but it's science. So after I do this, again, the scientists were not interested. So I left the university for the second time. And I write my book on the biology of how cells work. And in my chapter two, I lay out the scientific evidence to show you genes do not control biology. I also introduce you to the exciting discoveries of epigenetics, a new field of biology that is unraveling the mysteries of how the environment uh, uh, influences the behavior of cells without changing the genetic code. And I call chapter two, it's the environment stupid. It's a takeoff from uh, President Bill Clinton's campaign saying it's the economy stupid. And five months after uh, I write this, people are saying, what do I know? I'm not at a university, so what do I know? And then uh, Nature, in the, one of the most prestigious journals in the world, Nature, five months after my, my book, an article call about stem cells are engaged in a constant crosstalk with their environment. Biologists are fast realizing. No, some of them not too fast. What do you think they call this article in Nature? It's the same story. Science is now saying what I've been saying for 30 years is coming around now. And that there's a new science of how cells work. After lunch, I will show you the science of actually how the cells work, and you will have more knowledge than most doctors in the world today because they still believe in the genes. Now we'll go faster. But this is gonna be the fun part because this is where I'm going to explain how the biology actually works. And, it, and I will, um, we'll get to the secret of life before, before we're over. Okay, so what we were talking about is how, how cells actually work. And it's very similar to this. It's a, it's a machine. So just as the gears move and connect and turn and make an action, so do the proteins inside the cell. And the, there are proteins, I said there are 150,000 different proteins that provide both for our structure and our behavior. So 150,000 different shaped proteins. Now, uh, there again, it's like inside the cell, they're just like a, a, like a clock with all the proteins engaging like gears. So this picture is uh, going to show three different examples of proteins. These are molecules blown up very large. And the question is, what makes each protein a different shape? So why, where does the shape come from? And is underneath the uh, skin, <laughs> there's a backbone inside each protein, a backbone. And just like a backbone gives you your shape or you, you can change your shape, so does a protein. Now, what's really interesting is that all proteins share the same characteristics, so I only have to talk about one protein, but then I'm talking about all proteins. All proteins have a backbone made out of linked units, just like the vertebrae. The protein, the backbone pieces are called amino acids. There are 20 different shaped amino acids. And what makes each protein different is the, the length of the chain and also the sequence of the different amino acids. The DNA, the gene, 
is the information of which amino acid comes after the other amino acid. But this is, um, this is not the best model because all the beads have the same shape. So I'm going to use three different shaped pipes. A straight pipe, one with a 90 degree bend, and one with a 45 degree bend. That's just three out of how many? So, okay, and they, they're just like the beads, they, pu they plug into each other. And these are, these are bonds, and in the real n chemical name, they're called peptide bonds. So I will assemble this one protein. And now you can see that the sequence gives a rigid backbone. And one quick question. If I take this apart and put it back together again in a different sequence, will I get the same shape? No. So, so good, because that means what, what's the point is that every protein has a unique sequence. So how does it work? Let's go to this picture. You get that one day, can you in your mind see them moving? Okay, now replace the gears with protein. Okay. Now in your mind, can you imagine when this protein moves, it moves this protein, and then it moves this protein. And this is a, a, a combination of a protein and a metal machine. Now take away the metal parts, protein machine. Now, there are different groups of proteins. When they move, they make different functions. And the proteins are called pathways. Okay, so there's respiratory pathway, a digestion pathway, muscle contraction pathway. Okay, so inside every cell are protein gears. When they move, they make functions. And most students in like, uh, medicine or science or complementary medicine study this protein system called the Krebs cycles. Anybody knows the Krebs cycle? And these are protein gears that when they engage create the function of the Krebs cycle. Okay, now are you ready for the secret of life? Okay, before I tell you the secret, I want you to know the, the sky is not going to open up and the light come in here. It's not such a big secret. Like a backbone, the, you can twist and flex and change the shape. So I will show you two shapes and ask you which shape is more stable. One or two. And you can't answer the question because I leave out one fact. Okay. The yellow pipe are both negatively charged. One, or this is two, one, which one? This one, yeah, because the, the two negative charges, they repel each other. Okay, now the secret. There's a protein, and then there's something called a signal. The signal can be a chemical, like a drug, a hormone, a growth factor, or a signal can be a vibrational wave. But I'll use the chemical one because you can see it. Now here's what it, this is negative, the yellow, okay? And this is positive charge, but more positive charge than this has negative charge, okay? This comes like this. And when it gets near the protein, it will bind. What's the charge at this end? Yeah, and the charge here? Is this more stable or is this one more stable? What did it do? It, it changed shape? It moves. Movement is where life comes from. When proteins change shape, they create behavior. Now, if the signal comes off, what does a protein do? It moves back. 
so that you are made out of proteins that gives you the structure but the also? movement is the protein plus the signal so if you are dead and you are you still have your protein body what's missing the signal okay so in this uh protein gears and it's each protein is like a lock and the signal is like a key and there's a different signal for different protein when the signal when the signal uh, moves and binds to the protein behavior just... when the signal is not there no behavior if you want the behavior to go again what do you have to do An the signal. under signal another signal and then protein goes again your body will move when the signals come will stop when the signals are not there so these are the, again the three different proteins and these are actual molecular studies of how the protein moves with signal one with signal two signal three and this is the behavior of protein now, in medicine, the signals are always indicated to be physical chemical because medicine is Newtonian. So all signals must be matter. Recently, uh, physicists are looking at protein movement. And this is a paper in the journal Nature. And these two authors, Popfristic and Goodman, we're studying how proteins move, the behavior, and they wanted to predict the movement. So like Newton, when he predicted the movement of the planet, they used Newtonian physics, a Newtonian equation to predict the movement. It didn't work. And this is a review of this paper. And this chemist, physical chemist writes, the most pressing question raised by Popfristic and Goodman, when will chemistry textbooks begin to serve as aids when? rather than barriers to this enriched quantum mechanical perspective on how molecular turnstiles move? Because when they use quantum physics to study the movement, they were able to accurately predict the movement. So the most important conclusion is the subtitle of the, the article. What are the forces that control the twisting and folding of molecules into complex shapes? Don't look for the answers in your organic chemistry textbook. The reason why this is important is that medicine is based on organic chemistry. And the answers to how life works are not in the book. In a more recent, uh, a more recent one, this uh, concept of materialism, matter only, false. Okay, this is a, a more recent paper just a few months ago, and they, how they control biological functions. They were studying protein movement, and what they showed was this. It acted as a quantum mechanical machine. And if they shine a light on the protein, when the light, when the waves were in phase, the protein was active. And when they shine the light and the waves are out of phase, it shut off the protein. So it says, for a quantum mechanical object, one can arrange interference of several paths to create constructive interference that selects one state and destructive interference that blocks the other. Proteins respond to good vibes and bad vibes. So this is a picture of the light pulse that they shine on the protein to make it active or to shut it off. So our belief that we use today in medicine of chemical control is incorrect because the proteins respond to the vibration. So now you have enough information to know how life works. You are made out of protein. 
the signal, where does the signal come from? Field, yeah. right. And so uh, the field is the signal. Medicine talks about molecules, but then physics talk about energy control. So the energy in your body that controls the protein is a vital force. So the new science brings back the old story of vital forces controlling life. So when a signal binds to a protein, what happens to the protein? It moves. It makes behavior. Okay? Now, if you are healthy, your behavior is good. But if you have a dis-ease, the behavior is not right. Question. What can cause disease? There's only two things. Either the protein is bad or the signal is bad. Now, look. People with bad proteins got them from birth defects. Because if you were born with defective genes and the genes make the protein, then the protein is defective. But less than 5% of the population has birth defects. That means 95% of the people should have a healthy, happy existence. But if you were one of the healthy people and now you are sick, what would cause the problem? All right. Is there are only three ways to, to mess up the signal. One, trauma. So if I fall off the stage and, and make my, wrench my back, the signal is, is uh, interfered with. Number two, toxins. If the chemistry is not good inside the body, the signal cannot be passed through bad chemicals. Both of these interfere with the propagation of the signal. But the third one is thought, the mind. There is nothing wrong with the body. It's just sending the wrong signal at the wrong time. So if you change your thought and your mind, you can change the biology. And this, the mind, is the primary cause of illness on our planet today. Okay, so now, I will now go and say, the brain is, is what controls the signals. So I will now show you how the brain of the cell works, so you, because it's the same mechanism that the human brain uses to control our own life. So where is the brain? What, could, what controls the cell? Brain. Where is the brain? They know. <laughs> yeah, they read your book. <laughs> the membrane. Now you might say, I, I said before that you and the cell are the same. So you might say, am I saying that your skin is the brain? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> In embryology, the sperm and the egg come together to make a, a, a zygote. And then the, divides, the cell divides and divides and makes a ball of cells called the blastula. And then the cells form three layers, three concentric layers. The outer layer is called ectoderm. The middle one is called mesoderm. And the inner one is endoderm. Each layer gives rise to specific tissues and organs. The ectoderm gives rise to two things. The outer layer, ectoderm, forms skin and the central nervous system. So like the cell, your skin is the brain. Well, I will show you now how it works. Inside the cell are the protein pathways. And the, surround, the outside of the cell is the skin or the membrane. The signal comes from the environment and goes through the membrane to go to the gears. So the membrane controls if the signal comes in, okay? The signal comes from the environment, the protein creates the behavior, and the membrane is a switch, okay? Th this is like the other slide, signal plus protein, do they know what goes over here? Behavior. behavior. <laughs> now, um, I'm going to show the signal comes from the environment and hits the switch, then the switch sends a signal into the cell to the protein to make behavior.
So the switch controls the signal coming in. There are over 100,000 switches on the cell at any time, but all switches are about the same. It does two things. One, it, re it reads the primary signal, and then the switch two sends a secondary signal into the protein. So there are two parts to the switch. In the skin are receptor proteins, and receptor means receiver, okay? Uh, do you have receptors? Habt ihr in, your, in your body? Name the big, the big ones. Eyes. The eyes, no. nose, ears, mouth. Okay, <laughs> what's the point? All of your receptors are built into the skin. And these receptors read the signals from the environment. So it's just the same as a cell. This is a simple like eye or ear or nose. The receptor has an antenna, responds to the, the vibration signals from the environment. What, what happens when a signal binds to a protein? What happens to the pro protein? The protein moves. So there's two states to a protein, before the signal and after the signal, two different shapes. When the signal is active, it connects this one to this protein, to this protein. And this protein, the effector, makes an effect. And it sends a signal into the cell to control the proteins. So the primary signal is picked up by the receptor. Then the receptor connects to the processor protein. And then the processor connects to the effector protein and that sends a secondary signal to the protein pathway. Okay, now I will show you a video of how it works. The, uh, this is the receptor with an antenna. This is the processor. Look at the shape and look at the shape. They don't connect. Signal comes, changes the shape. This hooks to this one. This one sends the signal into the cell. When that go, the signal goes away, the shape goes back and the switch is broken. No, it, this does not fit. But now the primary signal changes the shape. And then this changes shape and sends a signal in. And this signal controls the function, a specific function inside the cell. So this is, the, this is how a switch works. Okay, uh, in the new biology, they talk about the, uh, this is the uh, cell membrane, and the signals come from the environment, binds the receptor, and then the effector sends signals in to control proteins. And at the end, you get behavior. So signal causes behavior. This is, these pathways, there's a new field of science, and it's called signal transduction. And there are thousands of these different pathways. Okay. Um, the name of the protein in science talk is complicated. It's called a, a receptor effector integral membrane protein complex. But I will show you there was a name for this switch for over a thousand years. And I'll use the definition and then I'll show you the word. The function of the receptor is awareness of the environment. Like eyes, ears, nose, it gives you awareness of what's going on. The function of the effector is to send a physical signal into the cell. And I'll call it a physical sensation. So the definition of the switch is awareness of the environment through a physical sensation. Now in the dictionary is the word perception. And the definition of perception Awareness of the elements of environment through physical sensation. What is the name of the switch that controls your biology? Perception. 
And why that's important is that it's you and how you see the world that controls the biology. So conclusion number one, perception controls behavior. And the, what causes behavior? No, no, uh, yeah, yes, oh, yeah, the, the, the physical part. The protein. So the signal, the switch, controls the protein, which is the behavior. Okay. Now, we, we did not talk about DNA. When uh, you need a protein in the cell and it's not there, then you need the blueprint, which is the gene. So how does it work? I'm, I, I get very excited because I'm going to show you how a gene works. But before I do that, I want you to know that we have been given misinformation. When people say a gene turned on and a gene turned off, it sounds like the genes make decisions. Here is the simple truth. A gene is a blueprint. So if you go to an architect's office and he's working on a blueprint, and you lean over his shoulder and you say, uh, is your blueprint on or off? And he goes, that doesn't make any sense. A blueprint is, cannot be on or off. It's a blueprint. A gene cannot be on or off. It's a blueprint. The, the truth is, are you reading the blueprint or are you not reading the blueprint? And the gene does not make that decision. So this is how it works. In the nucleus of the cell are chromosomes. The chromosomes are units of heredity. And the chromosomes are made out of 50% DNA and 50% protein. What does the protein do? And the answer is, for 50 years, we did the experiments. We isolate the DNA and throw away the protein. And some people a few years ago said, 50% is a lot of protein to throw away. What is it doing? And the answer to this question will change civilization. And I'll tell you why. And the answer is because when you understand how the protein works, you understand that you control the genes. The genes do not control you. A chromosome is a DNA core with a protein sleeve. Pretend my arm, my bare arm, is DNA. And I write uh, with a magic marker a genetic code for blue eyes. And I say, can you read the gene for blue eyes? But I say, what does it look like inside the cell? Can you read the gene for blue eyes? If you want to read the, the gene, what do you have to do first? Take the sleeve off. What's the sleeve made out of? And what causes the protein to change shape? The signal. Okay, so this new science, it, this new science is called epigenetic control. Before in school, we teach genetic control which simply means control by genes. Epi means above, like epidermis. Okay, so epigenetic control says control above the genes. Now I will show a video how it works, very simple. Okay, the, uh, the chromosome is DNA core with protein sleeve. At the beginning of each gene is a protein called a regulatory protein. The signal binds to a specific protein. The uh, protein sleeve comes off, and then the DNA is exposed. Then a device will come up and make a copy of the gene, and this is the blueprint used to make the protein, RNA. And the signal comes off, and the gene is covered up again. Okay, now watch with fast. Signal from the environment, selects the specific gene, sleeve comes off, the RNA, you make a copy, DNA, RNA, and goes to make protein. And then the sleeve comes back on. Now this time, let's see what the DNA did. Come on, DNA!
Do something. Come on. Do Beweg something. Tu was. Do something. Nothing. The gene does no control. The gene is never on or off. The gene is red or not red. And what do you think controls the signal? Perception. Okay? Now, so this is the same kind of signal transduction. And so the receptors are the input from the environment. Then the signal travels through the proteins. It goes to the nucleus and affects the proteins of the chromosome. And then the copy of the gene is made, and that's the output. You are not the victim of your genes because you control your genes. One gene blueprint using epigenetic control can make 30,000 different proteins from one blueprint. So you can come with good genes and then through epigenetic control create cancer, diabetes, and it has nothing to do with the genes but epigenetic control. So you can come with good genes and make mutant products or you can come with a mutant gene and mutant become normal. I'll show you. This mouse is a mutant mouse, a goody mutant. Uh, blonde, fat, <laughs> and diabetic. This is a normal looking mouse. It's a normal looking mouse because it's a goody mutant. The difference, when this was in gestation, in fetal development, Yep. The mother was fed these uh, additives, and these affected the epigenetic control and covered up the mutant. So you can have mutant genes, but with epigenetic control, you can act and become normal. One more example. Okay, this is a mutant mouse called yeah. Kinky Tail. This is a mutant mouse, same one, normal tail. What's important is kinky tail is the same mutation in humans that causes spina bifida. And this gene can be covered up with gene. epigenetic control. So you are not the victims of your genes because you can change any of your genes anytime. The following is a quote from the scientist who did this. Both nature and I think it's written. So both yeah. nature and nurture are important, and both are intertwined. But what's bigger is epigenetics in terms of bulk. Genomics might be the tip of the iceberg, but epigenetics is the base. Medicine has some information about this, but it doesn't have very much about the bigger thing called epigenetics. When this becomes known to the public. It returns responsibility for your health to you and not, you are not a victim of your genes. And recently, uh, it is becoming more public. And the recent issue of Discover, DNA is not your identity. Yet every day, the media still tells you that genes control this and genes control that. And then people get nervous about what genes are in their family. And as Greg Braden said before, if you look for the disease, you can create the disease through epigenetics. Right now, it appears that about 95% of cancer is not because of mutant genes, but because of epigenetic control. And it can be passed from parent to child like genes. But the difference is you can change your epigenetics at any time. So uh, the central dogma, DNA, RNA, protein, primacy of DNA is not complete. Put in the protein for epigenetic control.
but the protein is controlled by the, the signal, the which signal. comes from the environment. So it's not the primacy of DNA that's in the middle. It's the primacy of, of the environment. Number two, perception, the switch, controls the activity of genes. If you change your perception, you change the reading of your genes. If someone tells you you're going to have a disease and you believe that, then you can create the disease. So uh, there are three conclusions uh, because I, I, can, I don't have enough time to talk about one, but I will list them. Okay, conclusion one, perception, how you see life, the switch, controls behavior because that's protein. Perception controls which genes are being read and how they're being read. And the one I didn't have time for right now is the third one. Perception can rewrite the genetic code. So perception controls life. No two people see the world in the same way. They have different perceptions. But let's do a perception test. Okay, uh, the, this is the, the question, the first one is a simple question because it's important because perception controls your biology. So the first, like the perception test is a simple one. Is the surface area of A greater than, equal to, or less than the surface area of B? Which is greater? B, yeah. This is, a, this is a, they're equal size squares. Not equal, but they're uniform. So I, I want to make a more, more difficult test. I will show you two surface areas that are not regular. You must, with your mind, see which is bigger. Okay, so it depends you. if you're in the front row or the back row or you have glasses or if you're well or not well what you see. So it's a, a question I'll use a, a map. Which has more surface area, Europe we'll or South here. America? Calculate in your head uh, the surface. The answer is the answer South America. Is. <laughs> South America is two times larger than Europe. Twice as large. You could see that, right? Ah, ah, the <laughs> map is wrong. This is the Mercator map. It was made by Germans. Where did they put Germany? Deutschland is in the dead center. Isn't the equator the dead center? This map is wrong. Do you want to see the correct map? It's called the Peters projection map. Which is larger, South America or Europe? The point is that you learn perceptions. And sometimes uh, your perceptions can be right and sometimes your perceptions can be wrong. Since perception controls biology, and since they can be right or wrong, then it's more accurate to say that belief controls biology. What you believe creates your life on the inside and on the outside. When I come back tomorrow, I will show you what, where you got your beliefs from, and I will explain why it's very difficult to change your beliefs even when you talk to yourself. It doesn't work. And that is the most important thing because when Greg said, do you believe you have powers and you can't express them, I will give you the neurological reason why it is difficult. And then I will show you how easy it can be to change a belief. Yesterday, uh, we were closing out, and the conclusion that we uh, dealt with was that uh, perception controls biology, because how we see life determines our behavior, controls our genes, and can even rewrite the genetic code. But since our perceptions are sometimes right and they're sometimes wrong, then it's better to call them belief so that it is belief that controls biology. You're not a victim of your genetics, that you are responsible for what unfolds in your life. Well, we talked about single cells yesterday. Today, I'm going to talk about a community of cells.
So when you look at yourself, you're not a single entity, but you are a community of 50 trillion cells. But it's important to understand the word community. Every cell is intelligent, but when they're in a community, they give up their personal intelligence and respond to the central voice. So that the community represents a thing, one thing called an organism. And in, in that community, that a cell must follow what the central voice is. And if the central voice says to die, the cells will die. So the central voice is the mind. And I will be talking about the nature of the two parts of the mind and why we have trouble sometimes controlling our life. So what I would talk about is the role of how this mind works. First, there are signals from the environment, the internal and external environment. The brain, the function of the brain is to perceive the signals and then interpret those signals and then send the information to the cells to control the behavior and the genetics. So the function of the brain is perception, and from that creates the mind. Now, we have heard of something called the placebo effect, right? The placebo effect is when you have a very positive thought that something can heal you, even if it's, we, you don't know it, but it's a sugar pill, uh, but you believe it's the real medicine, then you can heal yourself with that. So the pill didn't heal you, it was the thought that healed you. Statistics reveal that one third of all medical healings, including surgery, are the result of the placebo effect. Now, the issue is that the placebo effect is when you have positive thinking. There was a question this morning, what about negative thinking? And this is what medicine does not tell you, is that there is negative thinking and it's called the nocebo effect. And in the same power that positive thinking can heal you, negative thinking can kill you. They're both the same effect. One is more positive, one is more negative, but the effects are exactly the same in your health. One will heal you and the other can make you sick. The, uh, the point is, is that negative thinking can create all the effects of chemotherapy. Now think about this. If a doctor tells you you have a disease or the doctor tells you you're going to die and you believe the doctor because he's a professional, the belief will give you a disease and can cause you to die. So belief becomes an important part of medicine. Now, Many of you have heard about the drug Prozac. Every year, billions of dollars are spent on buying Prozac. And here's a surprise, that the Prozac is no better than a sugar pill, so that it is a placebo drug. And yet the people who take it believe in the drug so much, okay. it makes them better. So if you believe that something is good for you, it will be good. And if you believe that it's harmful for you, it will be bad. In the United States in the South, there's a religious group called the Baptist Fundamentalist. And this one group works themselves up into a state of ecstasy, religious ecstasy. And they believe God protects them. And so they will work with snakes, poisonous snakes, like rattlesnakes, to, and they will even get bitten by the snake, and nothing happens to them. Now look at this, though. Some of them, some of them will drink strychnine in toxic doses, and when they're in that state of belief, it does not affect them. So if you can drink toxic poison, then then why, why do we worry so much about the toxins or the food and the, and, and the air and all that? Because we have a belief that the toxins can kill us. And even on the, on the cigarettes, it's on the package, it tells you this will kill you. But even though I know this, I will not drink strychnine. And why? 
because my belief is not as strong as their belief. So if we were growing up and programmed with stronger beliefs, we would be more powerful than we are now. Belief is important about everything, in, including uh, our health and our aging and the world that we live in. This is a picture of some beautiful women that dance in what is called the Palm Springs Follies. And I ask, what do you think is unusual about these women? Uh, they, they, actually, they have arms, but they're in red gloves against the red, so it's hard to see. What is unusual? Their ages. To 75 years old, aging is not in their belief because they have a passion to dance and the passion keeps them young and alive and healthy. But most of us see other people grow old and expect that we must grow old like they do. And then the more important factor that Greg has talked about, belief becomes part of the field. So while you might want to believe you can stay young, the belief of everyone around you is more powerful and will get you to get old. So the question is, if we are so able to be healthy and young, why do we get sick? And one of the most important reasons is stress. I will now show you about how stress works using cells and then people. So I put cells in a Petri dish and I split the group into two dish, two sets. In one set, I put nutrients in front of the cells. The other, I put toxins in front of the cell. I put them back in the incubator, and I come back later and take them out. Where do you think the cells are in each experiment? When you come back, when nutrients are in the cells, in the dish, the cells move toward the signals as positive growth signals. But when toxins are in the dish, the cells move away from the threatening negative signals. So when, when the cell sees something that gives growth, they move to the signal with their arms open to take it in. But if the cells see toxins, then what they do is they move away from the signal and close themselves down. Cells cannot be open and closed at the same time. Cells cannot move forwards and backwards at the same time. The conclusion, cells can be in growth or they can be in protection, but they can't be in both at the same time. Uh, Fraga. Does Bruce believe that the expectations of the scientists affect the movements of the cells towards the toxins or nutrients? Yes, but if you do the experiments without expectation, then the results are independent of you as a scientist. It's a very good question, I'll tell you why. When research on drugs is carried out by the drug company, it will be four or five times more in their favor than when the same research is carried out by independent people. So it's thought the scientist is very important in the process. So cells cannot move in both directions at the same time. They cannot be in growth and protection. So in summary, cells move to positive signals when they're in growth. They're attracted to positive signals. And cells will move away from negative signals. Uh, they'll be repulsed, uh, but they're in protection. But there are signals that are neither positive or negative. I call them elevator music. When you get in the elevator, you don't dance, but you don't get sick. So, But the same thing happens in humans. The mind will perceive the environment. And if it sees what it believes to be threatening, it will send a signal to the cells telling them that the environment is not supporting. And the system is called the hypotha hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The hypothalamus is the part of the brain that interprets the perception. When the hypothalamus sees stress, it wants to tell the whole body something is going on. So it sends a signal to the pituitary gland, which is called the master gland. And that gland sends signals to 50 trillion cells.
But in the, if it's a threat, it will send the signals to the adrenal glands, and the common understanding of the adrenal glands is fight or flight. Then the adrenal glands release stress hormones to the body. And the first thing the stress hormones do, and, and I'll, I'll make a quote from a, a physiology textbook. The stress hormones cause the blood to preferentially go to the arms and legs. And why would the blood, why the preference for arms and legs? Right, that's so you, you can run or fight. But there was, you miss something when, when I say it that way. If the blood is preferentially going to the arms and legs, where was the blood before it was going to the arms and legs? It was in the viscera. And what's the function of the viscera? Growth, health, Wachstum, maintenance. Gesundheit. Okay, so then logic. If the blood leaves the viscera, what happens to your ability to grow and maintain yourself? Well, it goes down, and the reason is when you're in protection, you shut off growth. So like the single cell, the whole body is in growth or protection, but not both at the same time. Now, some people think of growth from a, from a baby to an adult, but everybody needs to grow every day. Even if you're 100 years old, you need to grow every day. And the reason is, is that your cells are dying every day. Billions and billions of cells, like the, the lining of the gut, has to be replaced every three days. That's why chemotherapy is very toxic. Because chemotherapy kills dividing cells, whether they're cancer cells or normal cells. That's why people that are on chemotherapy have trouble with digestion. And they're also their hair falls out and doesn't come back and the skin doesn't grow well. So if your days are filled with stress, then you are putting lots of hormones in your body to direct you for fight or flight. And that is why you start to get sick when you're under stress because you are not replacing the cells at the normal rate. Okay, now there's another important effect about stress. When the hormones go from the hypothalamus to the pituitary and then to the adrenal gland, it releases the stress hormones. As I said, the stress hormones ca cause the blood to go from the gut to the periphery because the hormones squeeze the blood vessels in the gut closed. And the function of the stress hormones is to take the energy of the body and get it all to run and fight. So the stress hormones will shut off the functions of things that will not be needed in fight or flight. One of the most uh, uh, important uses of energy in the body is the immune system. And now think of this, the logic. Let's say you have um, a bacterial infection and you have diarrhea and a lion is chasing you. How much energy should you put in to fight the infection and how much energy should you put in to run away from the lion? Forget the immune system because if the lion eats you, then the bacteria are his problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the issue is this. Stress hormones shut off the immune system. And the significance is, it's important, is that every one of you right now is infected with almost all of the disease germs that humans have. Right now, if I take a blood sample, I will show you you all have viruses and bacteria and parasites. And you might say, well, if I'm infected, then why am I not sick? Because if your immune system is working properly, it will suppress these parasites and germs. But the moment you start to shut off the immune system, then these organisms begin to start growing again. So the idea that you catch a disease is not really true. You already have the disease. And the med medical people call these germs and parasites opportunistic organisms. So. Uh, if, if you are under stress and you, sh and you shut off the immune system, 
then you give these organisms the opportunity to then make the disease. And yet, when we get some of these diseases, we go to the medical doctor and they give us drugs to kill the germs and the bacteria. Well, this is very helpful if the disease is going very quickly. That was not the problem in the first place. The problem was stress that shut off the immune system. So to get, to get healing is, okay, treat the disease, but also treat the stress. Okay, so now we have two problems with stress. It shuts off growth and it shuts off the immune system. There's a third problem, which I call, uh, uh, it's, adi it's adding more, more stress. It's adding more stress, a third problem. When you are in fight or flight, do you think you use conscious reasoning or reflex behavior? You use reflex behavior. So very important, listen, the stress hormones, I said before, squeeze the blood vessels in the gut, causing the blood to go to the periphery. But when the stress hormones come into the body, they also go to the brain and they squeeze the blood vessels in the front of the brain where consciousness is, to push more blood to the back for reflex behavior. That means when you're under stress, you are less intelligent. And for my example, I give you the people of the United States. And the reason is the government knows this. And ever since 911, they keep in the media, the newspaper, the television, more stress, more stress, and the result is very important. And the importance is this, since 911, every year, the pharmaceutical companies have made 20% more profit every year. In five years, 100% more profit in selling drugs. So it's important to realize that stress affects you in many different levels, but all of them result in shutting down your life. So in our next picture, it's like the cells People move toward positive growth attraction signals, and people move away from fear or, or threatening signals. When you move in this direction, you're in growth, and in the other direction, protection. And some things in our world are like elevator music, indifferent. Okay. It has now been demonstrated that love is the greatest growth signal in the world. For example, in uh, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, where they have orphanages, uh, uh, who was the, <laughs> the, the leader of Yugoslavia? Uh, Yugoslavia, uh, uh, I think, you, don't you mean Romania? Romania, yeah. oh, Romania, yeah, yeah go ahead with also it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ceausescu was yeah, the leader. Yeah, yeah. that uh, the people could not afford to take care of their children, and they sent them to orphanages. They got food, clothing, the protection of living in, inside. They got everything they needed to live except love. And about 40% of those children became autistic. What is autism is, is the, the child is shutting itself off from the world. It's in protection, closing itself down. And all of the parameters of health and intelligence in these children were greatly suppressed. They got everything but love. Okay, now the issue is when we are in this direction in protection, we shut off growth and that's when illness starts. So when we're on this side of the scale, protection leads to disease and growth leads to wellness. And I said, well, what causes this disease? And the answer is stress. Now here's the problem that people do not realize. If I just remove the stress from my life, where am I on the scale? It's zero. If you want wellness, it's not just the absence of stress. You need the joy and the love to go to growth. So if you're in the middle place, you're not in real growth and real health. So stress alone is not the problem. It is what we need is more love and life and happiness. And all of this is based on perception of how you respond to the world. So now the most important question is, where do our perceptions come from? Number one, genetics. We get instincts we are born with. You do not have to teach a child how to pull its hand out of a fire. 
it is also very complicated instincts. For example, when a baby is born, every baby can swim from the moment it's born, it can be born underwater and swim like a dolphin. And this brings up a question which I'll answer in a little bit. If we were all born with the instinct and the ability to swim, then why do we have to teach children how to swim? And it's related to the second source of perception. And that is the subconscious mind where our learned habits and learned experiences are recorded. So I maybe I'll talk about the swimming now. Okay. When a baby is very young, the parents are afraid that the baby will drown. So every time the baby goes near the water, the parents, ah, ah, the baby's by the water, by the sink, by the toilet, by the brook, wherever the water is, the baby hears the parents get very excited. So the baby learns that water is dangerous. And it has a fear of water because the parents express the fear, so the baby is afraid of water. So when the baby is five years old, the parents buy, buy him a bathing suit. And they want to put the baby into the water, and the baby grabs the parents like a cat with claws. Because what is in the baby's mind? That the baby is, you're going to drown the baby. So the learned behavior can override the instincts. The third source of perceptions is the conscious mind, which is different than subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is learned habits. The conscious mind is creative programming. We talk about genetics because you were born with that as nature. It's in your nature to pull your hand out of the fire. But the subconscious behavior is learned, so it's based on experience, and it's called nurture. And for a hundred years, science says, which is more powerful, nurture or nature? And it's a useless argument, because what's more powerful, consciousness. When you are conscious, you can rewrite the instincts. And when you become conscious, you can rewrite the experiences of your life. So that it is important to recognize that what we are not using enough of in our world today is consciousness. And I will describe in a little while how most of our lives, 95% or more of our life, is controlled by the habits of the subconscious mind. Now the question is, in, d in development, what environment shapes fetal development. And the reason why the environment is important, as I showed you in tissue culture, the fate of the cell is controlled by the environment in which the cell lives. Whether it's just one cell or billions of the cells in a fetus, it's still the same response. So the question is, what environment is controlling the development of the fetus? No, it. Mama? The mom, absolutely. The mother's environment shapes the fetal environment. When a woman is having a baby and she visits an obstetrician, the obstetrician asks mainly three questions. Are you eating well? Are you taking vitamins and minerals? Are you getting exercise? Why so few questions? And the answer is this. Medicine believes the fetus is controlled by the genes, genetic determination. And so therefore, the development of the baby has nothing to do with the mother. And so therefore, uh, the mother's only role is to feed the baby. But as we talked about, the new science called epigenetics says that the environment controls the genes. Now think about this, this, this is an issue is there more in the mother's blood than just nutrition? Yes, emotions, yeah. the yeah. chemistry of emotions, the stress hormones, and all the other factors that control the mother's body also go into the placenta and affect the fetus. If the mother is happy, the chemistry of happiness makes the baby happy. If the mother is stressed or angry, the baby is stressed and angry. It's not the baby's brain that is controlling that, it is the response to the chemistry of the mother's blood. And now we know that the baby's brain is learning, halfway through pregnancy the brain starts learning. 
So the emotional patterns and behavior of the mother are being learned by the baby before it's born. But this does not leave the father out of the picture. Because if the father irritates or upsets the mother, then that is translated to the baby. And you might say, why should nature allow the mother to influence the baby so much? And the answer is this. When the baby is born, it will live in the environment that the mother experiences. So the mother is nature's head start program. It prepares the baby for the world that is, that, that is present when that baby is born. And that the influence of the mother and the chemistry of her blood influence the genetics of the child. So for example, the experiences of the mother during World War II, and this is in, in the Netherlands, a scientific study, when there was not enough food and people were in starvation, the influence of the starvation on the mother was passed to and affected the genetics of the child. And when the child grew up and had her own baby, it passed the influence of starvation onto the next generation. In science, it's called the grandmother effect that the grandmother is influencing two generations. As I mentioned, medicine has said that all the development is just controlled by the genes of the baby, and that the brain and the nervous system of the fetus doesn't really work until just near birth. This is now proven to be totally wrong. That the baby, as I mentioned, is learning by midway through pregnancy, it's learning now. So if the father talks to the baby through the abdominal wall. The baby will learn the voice of the father, and when the baby is born and the father says any words, the baby will know which one the father is. And also it works with music because people play music to the baby and it learns the music before it's born. Now I'm going to show you uh, an experiment, a sonogram. And it's a, a sonogram of a fetus, and there's an argument between the mother and the father. It's in Italian, but it doesn't make a difference because an argument is the same in any language. But what I want you to observe is the response of the fetus. Quando un bambino nasce, ha già again. un passato. Shall Siete voi. Mind? Non dimenticatelo, perché nove mesi valgono una vita. Basta! Mi hai stufato! Non ti sopporto più! Non urlare, Insomma, basta! Quando un bambino nasce, ha già un passato. Siete voi. Non dimenticatelo. The baby experiences everything the mother experiences. And if there are patterns, that's when the baby learns. So we were affected before we were born. The personality we have was being laid down before we were born. And in uh, a, a new book called Why Love Matters by Susan Gerhardt, she describes how the brain develops and how our personality is already derived by two years of age. And that's the personality we will express through the rest of our lives until we change that. And I have been talking about how parents influence the genetics of the child, in a, in, and I say parents are genetic engineers because they shape the genetics of their child. And I've been talking about that for 20 years, and now finally science, and this is from Scientific American, and the conclusion as they show, the findings suggest that a mother's parenting style can affect the activity of a child's genes. So there is a lot of responsibility in being a parent that we have not been aware of because we've always said genes control biology, but it's the environment that controls biology. Question. In the news and worldwide, we see an increase of autism and learning disabilities in children. And I can see now how that is connected. And the question is, can this trend also be reversed or improved? Uh, okay, two parts. I will make two answers. One, there is a, an epidemic increase in autism, yes. But it's not all due to negative environments. So it's not all the parents' fault. It's an influence of the field. 
uh, an influence of things believed, for example, like vaccines, and there might be an influence from spiritual bringing in from the spiritual world. The question is, is there anything that can be done about it? And yes, the answer is, the answer is yes. One of, one of the most important things is if you catch it early, and the, you may ask, well, how would you know early? And this also brings up a, a, an important topic, which I'll expand on. When a baby is born, it has got an instinct to learn the parent's face within the first few days of birth. And you'll see when a, when a mother or a father is holding the baby, the baby will stare at the face. Within two, three weeks after the baby is born, the baby can distinguish on the basis of the eyes of the parents if the parents are happy or the parents are afraid or angry. And it's, it's a very important reason why the baby does this. It, because when a baby now is born, everything is new for the baby in the world. And the instinct of the baby when it comes across something new is to turn and look at the face of the parents. And if the parent looks like no, the baby will instantly learn that whatever that the baby was near was dangerous or shouldn't go near it, and it doesn't need to learn any more than that. It just looks at the face. And if the baby looks at the parent's face and sees that the father or the mother is happy when the baby is looking at something new, then the baby immediately knows that perception is that whatever that is, it is not bad. But you also might be familiar with this not just in babies, because when a child is on a playground and falls down from a swing or some toy, or the baby or the child will look for the parents. And if the parents are in shock, the baby or the child will cry. And if the, if the child looks at the parent and the parents go, like it's okay, the child will get up and everything will be okay. So the important fact is this, a child learns about the world first by studying the face and the eyes of the parents. And what's different about an autistic child, it doesn't look in the face in the eyes of the parents. It will look at a mouth, but then the signals don't, don't make any sense. And uh, there is a book uh, about, uh, called Attachment Bonding by a, a woman called Katie, K Katie Granju. And she describes how a, uh, uh, an adopted, uh, uh, an orphan baby was autistic and would not look at the face of the caretaker. So the caretaker would feed the baby with a bottle, but if the baby did not look at her eyes, she took the bottle out. And soon the baby learned to feed by looking into the eyes of the, of the caretaker. And that baby was no longer, it grew up not to be autistic. And this is a parenting problem because most parents do not know that this important communication is going on. So they're not paying attention when the child is looking for information in their face. And this interferes with the instinct of learning. So if parents do not pay attention like this, then frequently the child then starts looking everywhere for some information and then loses its focus and attention. And it contributes to attention deficit disorder. Sorry. It's short. Yeah. yeah. You, you said that influence the field, vaccines, and maybe spiritual world. So in this context, what is spiritual world for you? To start with, very quickly, I did not believe in the spiritual world. When I understood how the cells worked, I will show you this afternoon precisely what I mean by the spiritual world and how it connects to the cells. And it was interesting because I said, and, and, uh, and you asked a, uh, one woman asked a question about the scientist influencing the experiment. Well, I had no, no concept of the spiritual nature. I, that's why I was in science, because I was a mechanist. Uh, and the results of the experiments revealed the connection of us to the environment as our identity comes from the environment. So I'll talk about it later. This is a recent review from the journal Science. And it talks about the, where do the patterns of disease come from. And I will blow this up. And then this is what I'll read. Environmental processes influencing the propensity to disease in adulthood operate during the periconceptual, the fetal, 
and infant phases of life. So issues of cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, uh, diabetes, are all rooted in the earliest stages of our life, around the time of conception, fetal development, and the infant phases. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, an experiment that was done in Japan where they were teaching the mother, before she had the baby, the mother a computer program. They taught her uh, how to turn on the computer, and then a Japanese uh, script for a color would show up. And on the bottom of the screen was a color bar. And if she would select the right color to match the script, a coin would come out of the computer, and she could take the coin to a vending machine and buy, uh, and buy a treat. It took many, many months to teach the mother. Then she had a little baby chimp. And uh, the baby was so small it couldn't really walk yet. And the mother was doing the experiments. And uh, one day she gets the coin and goes to the vending machine and leaves the baby. And the baby pulls itself up to the computer, turns it on, the script comes up, selects okay. the color, and then grabs the coin. And the scientists were, so, were shocked. Who taught the baby? The answer is very important. It suggests that infants pick up such skills solely by observation and don't have to be actively coached by their parents. This is exactly what happens to us when we are children. And it, it is a very important relationship to how the brain works. In uh, brain research, we study the, uh, what's called the EEG, which is the vibration activity of the brain. As adults, we have uh, very high and low ranges of activities going on all the time. But in our development, we jump from lower to the higher to the higher to the higher vibrations over time. For the first two years, from before birth to the first two years, uh, we are in the lowest frequency. Okay. From two, this is, for, for, an, for an adult, delta is like sleeping or unconscious. But for a child, it, the child is not unconscious, but it, the, because the child can't make a response, it, it is like behind a, a window watching the world but can't respond. From two until six, there's higher activity called theta. When we're in theta, it's like imagination. That's why children between two and six mix the real world and the imaginary world in their play. When the child gets to six, then another level starts called alpha, which is calm consciousness. When the child reaches 12, it can express all the ranges from delta, theta, alpha, and this is like schoolroom consciousness, beta. The most important point, consciousness, the way we think consciousness, is not available to the child until after six. The first six years are pro the programmable state. The reason is this low activity is called the hypnagogic trance. So when you, if I want to hypnotize you, I have to take you from higher levels into lower levels, and then I can put information into the subconscious, which is in here. This is an important reason for this period. This is a period of enculturation. A child has to learn thousands and thousands of facts about how to fit into the family and to society. And so the, the uh, nature doesn't give the child consciousness to to create new things, it just gives it the brain activity to download facts. Uh, people are familiar with the Jesuits would say, give me a child until six years of age and it will belong to the church for the rest of its life. Because whatever goes in the first six years is the first structure in the subconscious mind. The, the child is in a state of super learning. A child between zero and six can learn three languages at the same time. But after this period, if you try to teach a child just one language, it's difficult. 
So this period in our life is where we learn the fundamentals of relationships, connections, family, and community. So like the chimpanzee, whatever the baby sees, experiences, or, or learns from the family, it goes right into the subconscious brain. And this is also the period where we learn self-identity. Who are we? What parents tell us we become. So if parents tell us we are smart and bright and lovely and wonderful, that goes into the program. But if we are told we are not nice people or we're not smart or we're not pretty or we're not good, that goes into the program. So for example, in a store when a child is throwing a tantrum because it wants a toy and then the parents say, you do not deserve the toy, then the, is, that is the program I do not deserve. But once it's in the subconscious, it's recorded like a tape player. And the rest of your life, the subconscious will play, I do not deserve. I do not deserve. So that the programs that we acquired in the first six years shape how we live our life. But this is all below consciousness. So you, ha you may not know the programs you received because you were not conscious really during this time period. But most of us, most all of us, have received a program of not good enough, not, you know, not, not the best we can be. Okay, now let's talk about the, the next part. The mind has two parts. The subconscious mind is the original brain, and it can process 40 million bits of data from the environment every second. The mind is very powerful and very fast. But it's totally habitual. It's not creative. It can only play back what it learns. In evolution, the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, gives rise to consciousness. It's a small piece of the brain that is consciousness. Self or consciousness is an add-on option, and most people don't exercise the option. But note, it, has, it can process only about 40 bits of data per second. The subconscious mind is one million times more powerful. While the subconscious mind is fast, the conscious mind is slow at processing. That's why when you're in an emergency or stress, the, you operate from this one because it can operate fast and handle lots of data. But the difference between the two is this is habitual. It is the conscious mind that is creative and can generate free will. Just to give you an idea of the difference between 40 million bits and 40 bits, I'll show you the next picture. Imagine this picture has 40 million pixel dots, which is like one nerve, uh, you know, each nerve going into the subconscious. How much, if you open your eyes, how much of this picture does the conscious mind see? That much. So I put a, the, that much, 40 <laughs> pixels. Well, the conscious mind is only aware of this much. The subconscious mind is handling all of the other information. The conscious mind can control anything in your entire body. They used to say there were parts of our body that were involuntary control. But now we know that's, that's not true. For example, yogis can regulate their heartbeat, their blood pressure, or body temperature with conscious mind. So while the conscious mind can only handle a few things, the subconscious mind can do many, many thousands of tasks at the same time. Now, recently, neuroscientists are talking about how your unconscious really shapes your life, your decisions. What they say, according to cognitive neuroscientists, we are conscious of only about 5% of our cognitive activity. So what this means is every day, and 95, excuse me, 5% uh, is high, they say that most people, 1% of their day is in the conscious mind. So every day, you, you create only from your creation mind, your conscious mind, 
only about 1% of what is going on in your life. And therefore, 95 to 99% of your life comes from your programming in your subconscious mind. So what this means is maybe uh, you were the child in the store and your parents said you do not deserve. 95% of the day, you will sabotage your life to make sure you do not deserve. And the reason why is the subconscious job is to create reality out of the program. And so therefore, if you have negative programming, 95% of the day, you will create that negative experience in your life. Now, here's the problem. The conscious mind and the subconscious mind work together. So whatever the conscious mind focuses on, it can control. But what it's not focusing on, the subconscious mind controls. So most of our day, we are thinking about the future or thinking about the past. That's with the conscious mind. So if the conscious mind's not paying attention to right now, then everything you're doing during the day is being run by the program that you got. But the problem is, because your mind is not, the conscious mind's not paying attention, then it does not see the program being played by the subconscious mind. I'll give an example. When you first got you in the car with a driver permit, you didn't know how to drive a car. So you were very conscious of everything, watching everything as you were trying to drive. But now you've driven for 10 or 15 years. And you might be like me. I can have a passenger in the car, and my conscious mind will be in, in a conversation. And I'm driving 10 minutes. And then I look out the window, and I realize I didn't pay attention for the last 10 minutes. Did anybody else do this besides me? <laughs> the lesson, if I said, Describe your driving behavior during that 10 minute period. You would say, I don't know, I didn't see it. This applies to all of our activities every day. I'll give one more example. If you know somebody and you know their parent, and you see that this person's behavior is just like their parents, and then you say to your friend, Mary, you're just like your mother, then Mary will say, what, are you crazy? Why doesn't Mary see she is like her mother? Because when she's playing that behavior, she was not paying attention. So she doesn't see that she's playing the behavior that she was programmed by through her mother. So most of every day, you are not playing programs that you personally want. You're playing programs that you got from other people. But you didn't see those, pay those programs. So when your life doesn't work, you say, the, the universe does not support me. And yet, the truth was, it was your own invisible behavior that sabotaged you. So what's important is some people say, well, maybe I just do some positive thinking. Which, which mind does the positive thinking, conscious or subconscious? The conscious mind, which works at 5% a day with a 40-bit processor, and when you're doing your consciousness, are you paying attention to what's going on? Those Who's running the show? The experiential programs from the subconscious mind, and that is 95% of the day with 40 million bit processor. Does positive thinking work? Do the math. And the issue is that it's very difficult to take a small processor and overpower the large processor. And you have to use what is called willpower with the emphasis on power to override. Now here is the second catch or the second problem. The subconscious mind is like a recorder tape player. It records an experience and then when you push the button, it plays the experience back. I don't know if they, they say it here, but uh, sometimes we say, somebody says, he pushed my buttons. Push the tape and the, the behavior plays. So then we take our conscious mind and we want to talk to the subconscious mind and change the program. Now think about it this way. You have a tape player and I give you a cassette with a program. And you put the tape in and you push play. And the program is going, you say, I don't like the program. Then you go up to the tape player and you say, change the program, well, change the program. How much yelling at the tape player will cause the program to change? First we talk, then we yell, 
then we get mad, then we ask God to change the tape. The issue is the tape will not change by doing that, but there are ways to change the program if you know how to push the record button. There are, I will talk about, just mention three different ways to control your life. Number one is Buddhist mindfulness. And what that means is, if you are conscious and pay attention, then you don't play the tape. And I bet everyone in this room has experienced a time in their life where you did this, and it was one of the most special periods of your entire life. It was the day that you met your special partner or the person you fell in love with. If you think back to the period where you really had your first big love affair, I bet you you were happier and healthier than you ever were, even from the day before you met them. And I call this the honeymoon period. Why was your life and your honeymoon so beautiful? I'll give an example. The day before you meet this person, how long did it take you to get dressed? Five minutes, you put your clothes on, you're out. How long did it take you to eat your dinner? A few minutes, and then you wipe your face with your sleeve. But now, today, you meet your special, your special love. You're going to go on a date. How long does it take you to get dressed? Be an hour or more. And then you go to dinner, and I bet you remember every rule of etiquette. You use the right fork and the right spoon. The <laughs> napkin, you blocked. You f- <laughs> and you didn't talk with the food in your mouth. What was different that day than the day before? You watched yourself. You didn't let the automatic program play. You were consciously controlling everything because you wanted to show your special person who you really are, so you made an effort to watch yourself. So both people are being their best they ever have been. And love is everywhere. And then time, <laughs> time goes on, and then your life comes back in, and you start to get busy, and your mind starts to think about the job or the world or whatever it is. So while you're thinking with your conscious mind, then you're behaving with which mind? The subconscious mind. Whose programs are in the subconscious mind? Yours or somebody else's? So your friend comes up and asks you a loving question, and your mind is thinking of something. And then you respond like your parent to them. And they look at you like, what kind of behavior is that? Did you see the response, yes or no? So you say, what are you talking about? And then the arguments begin, because now you're communicating as a different person. You're not communicating with the person you believe you are in your conscious mind. So if you were the child in the store at six and you were told you do not deserve, and then you're on your job in a little tiny room doing a little job and you're thinking, I'm better than this, I should be running the company. And while they're thinking that, They're doing a job. Who is running the job? The subconscious. And what is the subconscious program? You do not deserve, so you make mistakes. How many of you were told you were average students? And then you take an exam, and when you get the test back, you look at a question and said, I knew the answer to that. Why did I mark it wrong? Because the subconscious job is to create the reality of the program. So your life does not reflect what you want, it reflects the program you were given. So one way out is consciousness. Just be conscious and then you don't play the tape. A second way out, clinical hypnotherapy. Because that puts you back in the same brain state that you were in in the learning period. And then you can put a new program and rewrite the tape. Yet there is a better and faster way even. There's a group of new psychology modalities called energy psychology. There are many different versions. For example, uh, holographic repatterning, body talk, EMDR, EFT. The one I am most familiar with is Psych K, P-S-Y-C-H hyphen 
8K. These programs are like pushing the record button on the tape player. These programs can change a belief you had your entire life in maybe 15, 20 minutes. Many of them, like Psyche, create a state of super learning like you were when you were an infant. I, I am not going to talk about these modalities. On my website, I have a list of all the different ones, uh, most of them now, and you can select that and go to their own website and read about them. Okay, now what I want to talk about is your thoughts go in and adjust your body on the inside, but I'm now going to show you how your thoughts go out and affect your life on the outside. This is an older picture of a new technology called magnetoencephalograph, MEG. EEG, you put wires on your skin and read the brain activity. MEG, the, the probe does not even touch the head. You can read your brain activity outside of your head. It's not magic. When a nerve carries a signal, it's like an electric wire. It has an electrical component as shown in the black arrows. And so the electric component can be picked up by electrodes on the skin. But when a wire is carrying a current, it also has a magnetic field around it. And in physics, they call it the rule of the right hand thumb. If you, my arm is a wire and the current is going from here to here, I take my right hand with my thumb pointing in the direction of the current flow and my fingers show the polarity of a magnetic field that goes around the wire. The magnetic, the magnetic field passes through the skin. Your thoughts are not contained in your head. This was an experiment by uh, an Indian scientist, Amit Goswami. He was in What the Bleep. He had two people meditate on each of them being present together. And then he separates them by 50 feet. And in one of the people, he flashes a strobe light in his eye very fast. And it causes uh, what they call an evoked potential, a very fa fast firing of the brain. Well, this one saw the light and had the evoked potential. The other one, 50 feet away, at the same time he had the evoked potential, the other one had an evoked potential and didn't see the light. Because as I talked about yesterday, people are not particles, they're waves and waves become entangled with each other. The people that you get connected to, you are entangled with. And many people are familiar, if you think about someone you, or talk about someone you haven't seen for years, and I say, oh, I haven't seen my friend John in 10 years, and the phone rings and it's John, or a letter comes in the mail from John. Most people experience something like this. It's like, the placebo nocebo. When you think very positive thoughts of someone, they make an effort to get in touch with you. But it works both ways. If you have a negative thought about somebody, wherever they are, they will create negative talk about you. So it's very important to recognize your thoughts and your judgments are not just connected to you, they're connected to the people you talk about. So in this People know that if you hit the right frequency, you can cause a crystal goblet to explode. It's called harmonic resonance, or I showed yesterday, constructive interference. When two waves are in phase with each other, remember where they meet, the power, the waves got bigger? Well, atoms vibrate at a frequency, and if I use the same frequency with a tuning fork, constructive interference, and it causes the atoms to spin faster, and then the glass explodes. Now the question is, in experiment, if I hit the tuning fork, what will happen in this picture? All of them? This, only this one. Why? It's interfer interference this of the same frequency. Different frequency, it doesn't respond. Now you, are like a tuning fork with your brain and you're broadcasting frequencies of your thoughts. Which goblet is going to respond to your thoughts? The one that is harmonically resonant with your thoughts. If you live in fear, you're not gonna activate the Dalai Lama, but you may get Scarface to show up. So when you are having thoughts, 
you are exciting and activating those things in the world that are connected to your thoughts. When a mugger is trying to pick out which person he is going to attack, which one of the different people walking down the street, which one do you think gets attacked? The one who is most afraid. Because the one who is most afraid will resonate, and that means that the mugger doesn't have to do anything, go boo, and everyone will give him, give him everything. But while it works for individuals, it is very powerful when a whole group of people have the same thoughts. You can't make a war unless enough people are ready to make a war. I'm going to show a, a picture of mass action here, and it relates to uh, in New York City one year after 911. So this is September 11, 2002, the one year anniversary of 911. What was everybody in New York thinking about that day? The winning number, 911. Because we collectively create the reality. When uh, Greg and I were in Australia and met with the, uh, the knowledge keeper, the Mandaeans, he said that through their practice they see into the future and they know about uh, Saddam Hussein. They knew about George Bush. And then he said, and the coming war. And Greg said, does that war have to happen? And he had a, a very wise smile and he said, no, if the consciousness changes, there won't be a war. And the point was, is that we are collectively creating the reality. And if we change our beliefs about reality, we change the world with that change. So I'm now going to take the jump because I mentioned I was going to talk about how I became spiritual. And I'm going to talk about cells. I'm going to talk about two identical cells. I chose liver, but it could be muscle, bone, brain, skin. But I wanted two identical types of cells. But this cell belongs to Bruce. Bruce? And that's your cell, Margaret's cell. No two people are the same. And I say that for a simple reason. If I take my cells and put them into your body, your immune system will say, not self, and destroy the cells. And if I take your cells and put it into my body, my immune cells will say, not self, and destroy the foreign cells. So cells have identity. And I say, where is the identity that makes one person different than another person? That's why I chose two identical cells, because here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove the color from everything that's the same between the two cells. So where the color is left over is where two cells are different from each other. Magic. Yeah. Where is the difference between two people? On the surface of the cells are receptors, like I showed on the switches yesterday. And receptors are antennas. And that the antennas on my cell receive a different signal than the antennas on Margaret cells. But where are the antennas located? On the outside of the cell. So where do you think the signal comes that activates the antennas? From the field. Let me give you the name. The medicine studies a small group of these receptors so they can match tissue when they want to do transplants. And medicine calls them self Receptors, what do receivers, which, what does this receptor receive? Self, the a same. signal, and the signal is from the outside. Now, if I take off my self receptors, I have no identity on the cell. I can take this cell and implant it to anybody, and it will not be rejected. It's a liver cell, not anybody special liver cell. But if I take Margaret's receptors from her cell, and put it on my cell, whose cell is this? Margaret's, yes, because if I put this back into my body, I reject it. But if I put my cell with her receptors in her body, it's accepted. I transfer ownership by transferring the antennas. Now, I want you to pretend that the membrane, the, 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 the membrane of the cell is opaque, no light can get in. If I put the cells in white light, what color will be in here? Nothing. So I put it in white, it's dark. 
But now I want you to pretend that the self receptors are like sunglasses. So what color is going to come into my cell? Green? What color? Green. And what color comes into Margaret's cell? Orange. Right. Okay, Get now on. the most important question. Where did the color come from? From the outside. And now what is the outside? All that is. And why is it important? Because the, if my only lets in green and Margaret lets in red, my green came from where? The white light. Where'd the red come from? Come. White light. The spirit is a piece of the whole that comes into you separate from the other person who gets a different piece. Okay, now here's an interesting question. If I kill the cell, did the green frequency disappear from the white light? No. What's no. the point? The identity came from outside. If the body dies, the identity is still outside. But in a future, if a future embryo comes with the same self receptors, what broadcast does it read? The same broadcast that provided for this one. You don't die because you're not inside yourself. You're part of the whole thing. And therefore, you're a part of this. You can never be separated from this because you are a segment of that. And when I understood this, I realized I was immortal in my identity because the identity and the cells are not the same. And by this guy, I, I got very excited because I didn't believe in this stuff, but the science was very clear that the signal came from the outside that made differences between people. And so at that time, maybe I had too much time on my hands. I asked my cells, if I'm already out here, why do I need this? And my cells gave me the answer. My cells said, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? If you're just a spirit, what does a sunset look like? If you're just a spirit, what does being in love feel like? And the reason is the cells convert the experiences of the world into sensation, which turns into electrical activity of the brain, which connects to our source. So the most important thing I learned at that moment was this place is for us to sense and taste and smell and touch and experience and love and live this planet while we can. And what happens when we live in fear? We shut everything down and the life is wasted. And the point about this is each person is like a frequency of the light in <laughs> refraction. What's white that, light, yeah. when the white light comes in, the spectrum comes out. If I push the spectrum in this way, what comes out the other side? White light. But each one of us is like a frequency. So we vote in this room, we don't like Mr. X. And we throw X, we throw Mr. X out. Okay, so we throw out Mr. X. I take the remaining frequencies and I push them back through the prism. Do I get white light? No. We, as a group, want the white light to come back to the planet. We gave the white light to people like Jesus and Buddha and Mohammed, but they were trying to teach us a lesson that we are the white light. The lesson we did not learn is that we ourselves in a larger thing called humanity. We as individuals are not evolving. Humanity as a collective organization is evolving. So we have to recognize each human is a piece of all that is, and all of us together make white light. And so we are in a state in the world where we keep killing off the cells, and it's not a coincidence that as we destroy the body of humanity, that humans are suffering from what are called autoimmune disease, self-destruction for the vibrations that affect the whole also create the same pattern in us. Okay, so um, the mind, let's talk about it now. That there's a super consciousness, something from the environment that plays through the self receptors.
There's a subconsciousness, which is our experiences and our instincts. Most people live their day-to-day -day life just using this. But if you take the superconsciousness and mix it with the subconsciousness together, that's what self-consciousness is all about. That's when you use your conscious mind and your experiences and create the life that you want, which may be different than the programming in the subconscious. And the difference between these is the uh, superconsciousness is intuitive. When you're having thoughts, they're really out in the field. There's where you pick up your information from. The subconscious is the autopilot. You, it will drive the car if you're not paying attention. And as we found out, 95% or more of the day, we operate with this. But when you take that one and this one together, then you're driving your own vehicle. So in conclusion, I say, well, what creates the life that we have? And the answer is spirit, the element from the field, and then the influence of the, of the spirit in the self is the mental process. So the reality that we're experiencing right now is a combination of spiritual and mental activity. The article is called The Mental Universe. And it's from a professor of physics at a major university called Johns Hopkins University. university. Instead of reading the whole article, I'll show you the exact two sentences at the very end of the paper. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. And this ties together all the work that Greg has been talking about in the field, the mentation, the spiritual element. It ties it to the physical body and your own consciousness. And therefore, we have a good message from science. We can create the world that we want, and what we have to do is become conscious. And then heaven will be on this planet right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.